Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. I'm Thomas Miller, your host. We're going to answer a listener question today. At the end of the program, we'll tell you how you can leave this. Hi, Thomas. It's Lizzie Grace here. I have a question for you today about the Midhaven and the Equal House System. I just got done listening to a few episodes of Old Soul, New Soul, And it inspired me to look at my own natal chart in the equal house system. I have to say, for someone who traditionally uses the Koch system, it definitely is a little confusing for me. I have a chart where my ascendant is on the first degree of Gemini. And so when I transferred my chart from the Koch into the equal, my midhaven shifted into the center of my ninth house. I don't really know how to interpret a ninth house midhaven. And I do think it's odd because then I have a 10th house cusp at Pisces now. And I have to look at that as merely just the 10th house cusp without the midhaven associated to it. I'm confused. First of all, Lizzie, thank you so much for this question and for being a podcast listener of Thomas's. He is one terrific interviewer, I have to say. And this is One terrific question, and it's one that I think every astrologer should ask. I'll tell you, when I started in 1965, I used Placidus like everybody else in those days did, or everybody that I knew, and the books too. And then, of course, I became, oh, look, here's another house system, Regiomontanus. Oh, look, here's another one, Coke. So you've got these various house systems, companies, and so on. It turns out that all of these house systems were devised by monks in the Catholic Church. Regimontanus was a monk. These were astronomers as well, going back to these days. You have to remember in those days, nobody was literate. Kings and queens were not literate sometimes and mostly so you had people who were literate and among those of course were religious people because they had access to materials even bibles which nobody else did it wasn't until the printing press came along which the catholic church fought tooth and nails that suddenly everybody could afford a bible uh, heretofore, Bible cost oh ten thousand dollars because a monk had to hand letter it and so on. So, the house systems were devised originally as a means of trisecting the distance between the midheaven and the ascendant for a given location on Earth, and these various methods of trisecting those that that distance. Uh, were really an attempt to get astrology even more precise. Because in those days, they had a very fatalistic approach to astrology, which is very understandable given the circumstances. Lives were shorter in those days. There were not as many open opportunities to anybody in those days that we have today for example. So life was, in fact, much more predictable. But they were trying to get even more precise because they believed that the planets and the signs had direct input energies into our lives, that they directly affected our lives. And if we could only get a perfect house system or a perfect astrological system, we will be able to predict everything. That was the motive. Well, there's a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, there about what astrology really is. It certainly gives leaning, leanings and inclinations and so on, but especially in the world that we live in today, where the opportunities for self-expression are far more varied and life expectancies are far longer than they were then. Uh, And also a much more complicated way of living today. The idea that every single thing is going to be predicted by astrology is childish. That's not the way it works. That's not even the way reality works. Nonetheless, we're stuck with these house systems. So here I am using Placidus and uh, for what several years i also tried coke 
which I like very much. If I did not use equal houses, I would use Coke, but I do use equal houses. And here's why it's very simple. In 1969, after I'd been practicing for about four years, I did meet Linda Goodman. We became friends for about four years. I stayed with her house at four in Cripple Creek and so on. Saw her, drove her around when she was in LA. At that point, she was writing her second book. She used equal houses. And I thought, well, let me try it because I will try anything to see if it works. And when I did, Lizzie, um, I thought, oh, this is very interesting. I, for example, I'm just telling you my personal reasons for using equal houses. Uh, in equal houses, I have the moon in the third house in Aries. And yes, it is an afflicted moon. So moon in Aries uh, mole mark or scar on the head or face. What side of the body? Well, in a man's chart, the odd houses rule the left side of the body. And my moon is in my third house. In Placidus, it was intercepted. And it was in my second house, which should be on the right side of the body. But it isn't. This scar that I have from childhood, it's invisible, but it's there from age five is actually on the left side of my, it's my left cheek. And that's in the third house. So that instantly alerted me. And I started trying it on clients using equal houses. In just a second, I will get to the dilemma of where to place the midheaven and why it will show up in the ninth or the tenth sometimes. But nonetheless, equal houses simply take, you take the degree of the ascendant and you place the same degree on each succeeding sign around the wheel. That's all that is. So I began to try it on clients, and I'm telling you, the first one that I tried it on was a, a woman client that actually Linda Goodman had sent to me because she was writing her second book at that point, staying at the Hollywood Roosevelt, and she wasn't seeing clients. And she asked if she could refer request to me, which was incredibly flattering at 26. She only sent me one, but it was a wonderful client, and she showed up. She was a, I knew this about her before she showed up. She was a neurosurgeon's wife who was at the time the, the leading neurosurgeon at UCLA. And uh, she was a Scorpio and she had on sunglasses. And so I said to her, I'd like to just ask a couple of questions to see if this birth time is right. Uh, your first pregnancy was a girl. And she kind of snapped at me the way Scorpios sometimes can do. Uh, that's right. And then I said, uh, your second pregnancy, and now I'm looking at her sixth house, Lizzie. Because in a woman's chart, her first pregnancy is shown at the fourth, and her second pregnancy at the sixth, and so on. It's alternating houses. Um, and I looked at her sixth house for the second pregnancy. I said, this is very confusing to me. Did, did you have twins and lose one at birth? And she gasped. Now, I'm 26 years old. Internally, I was jumping up and down. Externally, I'm trying to keep a straight face. It works. It works. She said, she took her sunglasses off and said, I cannot believe you see that. I wouldn't have even known that, Bob, if I hadn't had a hysterectomy last year in which they removed an undeveloped mass of teeth and hair from my second pregnancy. And I thought, wow. So frankly, Lizzie, I have never looked back. I continued to consider the other house systems. And generally what I found when, when they were dealing with interceptions, for example, uh, the books all were making sort of specious arguments. Well, when you live far north or far south of latitude, uh, far south or north of the equator, you know, it's a completely different. I mean, uh, the Eskimos uh, have a different. Uh, I'm thinking, no, they don't. An Eskimo may use whale blubber for money, but it is still money. It's still a second house matter. It's not an intercepted house. Eskimos still have health problems. And those are the sixth house. And archetypally, I found myself realizing that 
the natural wheel, which begins with zero Aries and continues around, or the equal house system, which is based on a specific uh, individual's ascendant, the equal distribution of these archetypes is the same, whether you are using whale blubber for money or a dollar bill or seashells. So that the archetypes for living are the same to me. I don't see the distinction or even the need it, to use interceptions, even though it may look that way to the naked eye and, and there may be some justifications for it. I, because of these physical facts, which I kept verifying over and over and over in readings, and nothing is 100% Lizzie in astrology. I mean, there are absolutely techniques to do this. I have found they are accurate at least 90% of the time. And when they're not accurate, it's probably because I've misread something somewhere. But nonetheless, um, they apply equally around the world. So that's why I began to just stay with, with equal houses. Now the question about the midheaven, um, in my case, the same thing is true. My midheaven falls in my ninth house. Well, if you think about it, Lizzie, graphically, if you look at a horoscope and you look at equal houses, you've got one degree of Pisces on your midheaven in equal houses, on your 10th cusp, rather, I'm sorry, not your midheaven. But you'll have one degree ascendant Gemini, so you've got one degree Pisces on the 10th cusp, but your midheaven falls back in the sign of Aquarius in your ninth house somewhere. Well, that graphically shortens your ninth house and opens up your 10th house in a way which in a general sense will indicate somebody who wants to get out of, say, academia and into life sooner. It doesn't mean that they're not a lifelong student. They can be, even with a, a shortened, I am. I have a, a shortened ninth house as you do, but I also have a loaded ninth house. The sun and Neptune and Mercury and Jupiter all there. Uh, so I'm a lifelong student, even though I very deliberately dropped out of Vanderbilt in my junior year because I realized the kind of life I wanted to li live did not require a degree. And I have not missed having a degree. I got, the, I got great education and I used what I needed to do needed to get to use but so i was in fact one of those people who wanted to get out into life i didn't my dad was a doctor i knew i wasn't going to be a doctor i didn't need that kind of education for what i wanted to do uh conversely with someone whose ninth house there let's say their midheaven falls somewhere in their tenth house that tends to open up their ninth house and kind of shorten their tenth house doesn't mean they can't have career success at all it simply means that they may tend to be, want to be more behind the scenes in terms of their career than, say, in a public arena. Or it may mean that they are, in fact, one of these people, like anybody who becomes a doctor, let's say, they require a lot more education. So that opening up of the ninth house will give them the birth belief or fate that getting more education is going to be valuable to me. So my dad, for example, I think it's 12 more years after, uh, after high school to get a medical degree to specialize and so on. So that's a, a kind of thumbnail way to look at it. And you still use that midheaven, which uh, would fall back in, in your ninth house somewhere in Aquarius by it. But, degree and so on, to move that midheaven back and forth to make aspects to the birth chart and use one degree for a year to see if that midheaven corresponds to events that fit the archetype of the planet that that midheaven is aspecting at that given age. So if you say, let's say, have that midheaven uh, in Aquarius in the ninth house and you move it forward 10 degrees and it opposes your moon, say, in the third you can say, did you guys move? Did your family move when you were about 10 years old? And did you, or, or did you have a sibling? Was a sibling born to you when you were 10 or born to your mother? So you can begin to ask questions that fit whatever archetypes are being triggered by moving that midheaven back and forth to rectify the chart. But I hope Lizzie and 
Thomas, that makes it a little clearer about why I use equal houses. Yes. And I think the question that Lizzie was grappling with is, well, okay, good, but I really don't know what to do with this midheaven that's floating around. The midheaven is supposed to be, if you're in Placidus, the midheaven is the 10th house cusp. It's your career. And all of a sudden, it's in another sign. You still use it. And in fact, my uh, my 10th house cusp and my midheaven are in the same sign. I have 10 degrees Libra on my 10th cusp, but in, in equal houses, the 10th house cusp and the midheaven are not the same thing. The midheaven is still the exact point in the zodiac overhead when you were born. And that and that's a really valuable point to know. But in equal houses, it probably won't coincide with the 10th house cusp. Sometimes they really are in different signs, as in your case, Lizzie. You've got the uh, the midheaven in Aquarius, and you've got your ascendant in, Pi- in Gemini. Uh, gee, I wish I had that. Because if you consider the midheaven as being your ego, let's say, then your ego and your persona at the ascendant are in harmony with each other. Mine aren't. I have a Libra midheaven and a Libra 10th cusp, and I have Capricorn rising. So already I've got a conflict between my persona and my career that I need to hopefully be aware of. So it, it, uh, it doesn't change uh, the meanings of either the 10th cusp or the, uh, the midheaven. In mine, they're the same thing. They're both in Libra and, and so on. In your case, they will be different and frankly, a little more versatile perhaps than, than mine or a little, a little more varied interest than mine, and you are probably easier able to integrate your interests, say, in astrology with your personality than I was. I've always had a conflict (laughs) with being an astrologer. I was just at a party last night, Thomas and Lizzie, a party. It was a a garden party, this was, uh, by some, I started to say, older people, but they're only maybe four years older than I am, three or four. A beautiful place, beautiful home, beautiful grounds, and uh, we got to talking about this, and I, I was talking to a very prominent lawyer here. What do you do? He asked me, and I, was, I said to him, do you want the truth, or would you like me to clean it up? And he said, no, I'd like the truth. <laughs> and I said, I'm an astrologer. I've been an astrologer for 57 years. And uh, he looked at me and said, really? And I said, yeah, and believe it or not, I'm, an, I'm a skeptic. And he said, well, may I tell you, so am I. And I said, good, you should be. And we got to talking and I said, honestly, I used to be embarrassed and ashamed to admit that I was an astrologer. I didn't want to particularly publicize because I saw so many flakes and and just silly people doing this stuff. And I didn't want to be associated with that. So I never have been. And uh, I also at one point, uh, I had a client who was a, a stringer for the National Enquirer and she sent a team from the National Enquirer to interview me about doing a column. Well, it turned out all they wanted was for me to basically do astrology and gossip about stars that I had read for, which I had no interest in doing. So uh, I did have a conflict between, uh, and in fact, when I became a television writer, I thought, well, I can separate the two. I'm doing astrology. I'm publishing 250,000 words a year in American Astrology Magazine under Robert Glasscock, but I'm going to write for television under Robert Glass. And the first day I was on the lot at Universal, my agent called and said, this Tom Thayer wants to meet you. And he was the head of television at Universal in those days. And I said to my agent, is he a good guy or a bad guy? He said, oh, he's a great guy. So I go into his office and we shake hands. And here's what he said, Lizzie. This is going to be about 10% business, about 90% personal. I hear you're a really good astrologer. And I thought, oh, great. (laughs) Hollywood's a small town. So... It astrology in those days was not something I necessarily publicized about myself. Uh, and now, of course, I'm fine with it. But there was that conflict. I thought that somehow that 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 would be ridiculed and and put down and thought of as silly, which it still is. But at this age, of course, and, and a long time ago, I don't care whether people think that or not. Anytime somebody like this, I didn't say this to this lawyer last night, but when people, I have a very good friend who's a cardiologist, cardiovascular surgeon, actually, 
well, I don't believe in astrology. That's nonsense. And I said, God, I had no idea you'd studied it. And he said, well, I haven't. I said, well, how do you know it's nonsense? Well, it just is. <laughs> All right, fine. So here you got a scientist, a doctor who knows something is tomfoolery that he's never studied, which is about as far from the scientific mentality as you can get. If you don't think astrology is valid, study it a little bit and see if it works or not. That's all. Yeah, which is what it. I did. That's and that's why I'm still doing it 57 years later, Lizzie, because it works. <laughs> now you mentioned. I hope that helps. Yeah, you mentioned that if you were not using equal, you would use what Lizzie was using, Coke. Yes. Why? Coke. Well, because it, at least in my memory of using it for a while, I don't remember interceptions in it. So even though you have different degrees on the cusp, they're all the, in order of the signs. There weren't interceptions. I could be wrong. But as I recall, because uh, I didn't particularly, I didn't get any difference using Coke over equal. Uh, but that's my recollection of that, Thomas, is that it basically is the same thing. The signs do follow that pattern no interceptions so in that in that regard and then it, it came i was introduced to coke through reinhold ebertine's books on cosmobiology he was a german astrologer and um, i that was another major eye-opening book for me combinations of stellar influences by reinhold ebertine but here again thomas and lizzie this is a We've all been told, and we can read online, that Reinhold Evertine is a very brilliant astrologer and cosmobiology a brilliant system, that he went to medical school. I thought, oh, great, another doctor who's smart enough to know. Us. Well, you go look it up, both of you, and you tell me if you can find anywhere, any evidence that Reinhold Evertine ever went to medical school anywhere. I haven't found any. But it's something anecdotally that's been passed along to us. And here's one more example. Uh, one of my favorite old astrologers, Grant Louis, Astrology for the Millions, Heaven Knows What. You're going to read in the introduction that Grant Louis, who had been practicing astrology for years and brilliant and wrote those two hugely popular and wonderfully valuable books, he suddenly at age 40 something, 42 or something, canceled all of his speech engagements. And for the first time in his life, took, a, took out a life insurance policy. And he made one payment on the policy and died, I believe, of a brain hemorrhage. And so his wife and children were able to collect on the life insurance policy. And that's a great story. Until you think about it. How do we know that's true? Did he publish anything about it? Did he tell his wife in advance that he was going to die and this is what he's going to do? We don't know. So this is one of the weaknesses in the astrological community that I have always resented is a willingness to accept things at face value without trying them or investigating them. Uh, and I, I just don't do it because, I, again, I'm a skeptic by nature, but I really started thinking about how would anybody know that unless he had, had either told his wife beforehand or had written it down somewhere, which is not the case. So that's another story like the one about Reinhold Ebertine going to medical school. It seems to me an artificial attempt to elevate astrologers in astrology on a kind of false basis. You don't need to lie about this stuff. One of the reasons I am so happy with these solar arc webinars that Thomas has been a part of, and this is how we met, uh, I didn't necessarily want to do mundane astrology, but students from Kepler requested it because I had given a webinar on solar arcs using the United States horoscope and Donald Trump's horoscope. So uh, we started those at the beginning of 2018. And we're now four years and six months, and we have had in five week increments at Kepler College, people have been paying to come back and back and back. We have the longest running continuous predictive astrology workshop on Earth. Thomas has been a part of it. And one of the things I loved about Thomas, the first one he was in after one or two or three of these, Thomas said, what do you think the, the predictive accuracy of astrology great question and i said back then i said i thomas people have asked me this and i i did give a stock answer i'll say oh 85 percent accurate or something but 
And I've said this to Thomas in these workshops now that we're so far along in them. If you look back over the track record of the things that we have talked about and predicted, I have to say we have been, and Thomas, please feel free to agree or disagree. I, we have been 90, 95% accurate. I mean, on everything. The very first thing that we saw in 2018, Lizzie, was a solar arc indicating the potential for a civil war in about six years. Well, we are now about a year and a half, two years away from that. Nobody was talking about civil war in 2018. We were. They are now. We, and we, they certainly are now. We were talking about the, in fact, in the webinar that I gave for Kepler College on November 4th, 2017, at the end of it, I said, you can see here the beginning of the end of Donald Trump. And he, I said, barring a military, military takeover, he will lose the election in 2020. Barring a military coup, actually, is what I said. Thank God all of this was recorded and in writing, because I have another pet peeve about astrologers, and I'll name one, Gene Dixon, back in the days, who was a famous astrologer in Washington, D.C., had an 800 number, you could call she claimed to have predicted JFK, John F. Kennedy's assassination. Well, she didn't. It was subsequently found out she had fudged all that. I don't like that. It makes astrologers look cheap and cheating and phony, and I really don't like it. So I am very grateful that everything that we have talked about in these workshops has been recorded because it's another instance, as I say, people don't keep paying to come back if you're wrong. And it's not just me. These people are doing their own. I make them do their work. I want them. Here's the first question, Lizzie, that they asked. Thomas knows this. The very first solar workshop. First question, is Donald Trump going to prison? And I said, you tell me, where do you look? If it's not in the birth chart, it's not going to happen. And I started them on the chart and made them do the work so that's uh i guess in, in a nutshell i hope that kind of answers that there's that one question. other piece of this that i'd like to extract here and that is whole sign has had this revival the whole sign original mm -hmm. chart the original house system has really come into contemporary vogue if you will of late mm -hmm. And that, of course, is where the ancients, before the luxury of time, <laughs> how do you construct a chart without time? But what they did have was the ascendant point, and they had that highest point in the sky. So they simply made the ascendant the whole first house, but started each house at zero degrees. So here you had the floating ascendant as well. Equal comes along and says, well, let's take that point and make it the cusp of each house. How do you reconcile this? And I know it can move things around a lot. I mean, charts, especially with the higher degrees of ascendance, can really shift and hold sign. And as you're saying, takes that scar on the left or right side of the body and distorts that particular piece of information. And that's exactly it, Thomas. I I tried a whole sign when it first became popular, and uh, it's fine uh, for what it is. I never got anything more out of whole sign, and in fact, uh, quite a bit less than using equal houses. So I've never used whole signs. All right, now so I really I, I really can't comment beyond that. It's just in my own experience, I didn't find whole signs nearly as valuable for me. And this issue on Placidus, because everybody starts with Placidus, and I've got to say, Placidus reads me like a book. It really does. Equal does too, and my chart, personally, is just very close equal and Placidus because of the way it lays out. But this fact that Placidus, in essence, breaks when you get up over or below 66 latitude, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how much weight should we put on that? I put none on it. None. Because okay. as I said earlier, the distortion becomes one of, well, you know, the Eskimos live completely different lives than we do. No, they don't. It's just the outer appearances. They still have money. They still have jobs. They still have health. They still have homes and families. They still have property. They still have careers. They have exactly the same things that we do. It's just that they use whale blubber instead. They use spears and so on. So it's, 
it never made any sense to me. But uh, again, in the case of, I was very lucky, Thomas, in that my moon, the way I was orig originally learning to do it, uh, was intercepted in the second house. And when Linda told me that she used equal houses, of course, I'm thinking back in those days, my God, the greatest astrologer in the world is using equal houses. I better look into this. And the minute I did, and suddenly my moon was in the third house and not the second, which is, in fact, the left side of my head or face. I thought, oh, that was just a cold, hard physical fact that you cannot argue with. It's either true or it isn't. And then when I began to find the same occurrences in other people's charts, like that woman with the second pregnancy, I would never have seen that in any other house system, whole or anything else. It was only true in equal houses. So for me, uh, I don't have to be told a hundred times when something is working. After two or three tries, four or five, okay, I can see this works. I'm going to use this. So that's, uh, I'm not against, I, I, and I tell people, Thomas, we all have three horoscopes that are equally valid and worth looking at. One of them is your timed birth horoscope with an ascendant in the midheaven. A second one is our horoscope in the natural wheel, which begins with zero Aries. Just plug in your birth planets and your midheaven and your ascendant into the natural wheel, starting with zero Aries. The third chart that we all have is a solar chart, where you simply place the sun on the ascendant on the first cusp. And you can find that in your computer program. You have, under house systems, put sun on the ascendant. So we have those three charts, and they're all readable, and they all are valuable and valid. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for this, Robert. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thank you, Lizzie. Now, if you would like to leave a message that Robert can answer in the future, you go to funastrology.com. In the upper left-hand corner, there's an orange button. It's called Speak Pipe. You can leave a message. You don't have to leave your email. It's completely anonymous if you want it to be. And if it's of broad general interest, like Lizzie's question, we can answer it. What we can't do is specific details of one's individual chart. But Robert is available for readings. For that, you can reach out to Robert through his website, rglasscock, the number four, site, S-I-G-H-T, dot com. And under the Me tab is a link to his email. So two websites, funastrology.com, if you'd like to click on the speak pipe, rglasscock, the number four, site.com to get in touch with Robert for a personal reading. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time on Old Soul, New Soul Astrology with Robert Glasscock. <laughs>